Binder Jet will allow for a lot more or lower cost, faster parts, and more high volume parts as well. Welcome to It's Material World, the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. With your hosts, Pranithi Padia and Tom Miller. In today's episode, the future of additive manufacturing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the It's Materials World podcast. We're happy to be interviewing someone today. So let's get right into it. First of all, what's your role and how do you inter- interact with additive manufacturing in your work day to day? So I am Lindsay Kibler. I work at GE Additive as a materials applications engineer, um, and I work a lot with our AdWorks consulting business. So I consult with external customers on how our materials can work for them and talk a lot about materials characterization. So what kind of properties you can expect from our additive materials. Uh, and then we also help them, you know, implement additive on, on their own processes and their own components. So what does that require from a materials perspective? Do we need to gather more data? How do you qualify a machine? How do you qualify in terms of material properties? So we work with a, a lot with our customers to make additive work for them. So a quick follow-up to that. Uh, this one's going to get just a tad bit personal in terms of your material science preferences. But in terms of additive, first, what's your favorite alloy to print with, if you have one? I know there are a lot of great ones, but please try to pick one. And then also, um, what's your favorite form of additive manufacture? I think my favorite alloy to print with might just have to be Inconel 718. I work with it a lot, and I'd say it's the one that I probably use the most for now. And just in terms of who my customers are and, and who I've been working with, but I work a lot with the laser powder bed fusion process as well. So for now, that's kind of my favorite. There are a couple of modalities out there that are really intriguing, but in terms of familiarity and what I'm most comfortable working with. Can you tell us what 718, Inconel 718 is? That's a nickel-based alloy, right? Yes, that is a nickel-based alloy that a lot of our customers use for high temperature, high strength applications for, you know, aerospace turbine components or even gas turbine components as well. So I was wondering, since I'm currently a college student trying to figure out my passions and what gets me excited, I was wondering what got you interested in additive manufacturing and what keeps you excited about this field to this day? Yeah, additive is really a really exciting place to be right now. I, I got into it probably about five to six years ago now. I was in a rotational program with, with GE. And right as I was finishing that rotational program, the Edison Engineering Development Program with GE Gas Power, right as I was finishing that program, Power was starting off their additive group. And so I was really looking to looking forward to getting involved with them. And so that's where I ended up off program was in a design role for additive manufacturing. I like how additive is a good marriage between material science and mechanical engineering. There's a lot of really good applications that you can develop from the mechanical side. Really, it's the material science that actually makes the process work. You definitely need both for this process. And I was excited to kind of approach it from a mechanical side at first and then kind of make my way back to a purist material sense. Quick interlude to define some of the terms that are going to come up quite a bit in this conversation. So first, additive manufacturing. What is it? Well, it's the layer by layer process of joining materials. The design is created using a computer-aided design software, or CAD software, and uploaded to the additive manufacturing device of choice. Now, since additive manufacturing can be a mouthful to say, we'll often abbreviate it just as AM for short. Now, the term additive manufacturing itself is a broad industry term, which also encompasses the paradigm of 3D printing. However, since additive manufacturing is the more broad term and it's a little bit more industry appropriate, and that is the term we will be using to describe it throughout this conversation. Next, we'll be letting Lindsay define some of the other major terms you'll be hearing in this conversation, most notably DMLM, EBM, and PBF. All these acronyms will certainly be coming up a lot and are crucial to know to discuss the additive manufacturing industry successfully. So first, let's discuss 
DMLM? DMLM is often, or DMLS or SLM are all kind of referring to laser powder bed fusion. So direct metal laser melting, direct metal laser sintering, selective laser melting, a bunch of different names for laser, laser technology. And next, EBM. And then electron beam melting is EBM or electron beam powder bed fusion, EBPBF. And finally, to define the term PBF. So those two modalities use an energy source to melt powder as you lay it down. So you lay down a layer <laughs> of powder, use a laser or an electron beam to then melt that powder in a 2D cross section, lay another layer of powder down. This process, in short, is often called powder bed fusion, which is often abbreviated to PBF. Thanks for joining us for this acronym interlude. Now back to your regularly scheduled programming. As I think we're all aware, at least the three of us here, end of manufacturing is really cool. Um, but I think with all that coolness and novelty comes a lot of hype. And I think a fair bit of misconception to come along with that. So what are these common misconceptions that you really see surrounding this field of additive manufacturing? And how, how do you try to debunk them? One of the biggest misconceptions that, that we work with on an almost daily basis is a lot of people think that additive, especially from a laser perspective, is a plug and play. You plug in your machine, you dump in some powder, you press a button, and it prints magically and perfect parts every single time. I wish. <laughs> right. <laughs> I hate to break it to you out there, but it is not the case. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we, we spend a lot of time just explaining all of the, the little nuances that go into what it takes to print additive components uh, for our customers. There's a lot that goes into it. There's a lot that you need to know about how to set up the machine, how, how to calibrate the machine, how to prepare a CAD file. So you can print a lot of things and you can print almost anything, but there are still a couple of rules and guidelines that you need to follow to, to print a successful part. We, we talk a lot about that as well. And then once you actually get to the printer, get that good CAD file loaded, making that sure that machine is running properly and giving you the material properties that you want is also kind of a challenge. These machines can be a little finicky at times, so we are constantly making sure that they are printing good part and printing good material. So yeah, there's just a lot more that goes into it than plug in a machine and, and press play. So based off that, since there's so many things that go into it from the design standpoint and the machine parameter standpoint, what have you found to be the most challenging part of the entire process or maybe the most time consuming part of that, that process? Honestly, I think it, a lot of the material development and parameter development takes a lot longer than people might expect. So yeah, you can spend a long time developing parameters to get a specific density or mechanical property requirement that you're going for. It can take a while. And so I think that's where a lot of the time and the money is spent is, is developing those materials. The OEM the machine manufacturers such as GE Additive, some of your other big manufacturers as well. That's, that's uh, really what you're buying when you're buying that machine and that parameter set is all of that experience that went into it. We pride ourselves on, you know, delivering some great parameters along with that, but then knowing how to use those parameters, knowing what they're good for, having that, the part then being able to print with that parameter is also a big portion that goes into it. But hopefully like over time, you'd be able to find similar parameter sets, right? Like you could develop, if it's a similar part, you could add a similar parameter set for the respective machine? Yeah, absolutely. Usually we develop parameter sets by material. So we might have a couple of different parameter sets for a given single material that might be focused more on productivity or more focused on getting really good mechanical properties or really good surface finish. But within a, a specific material, as we gain more experience, both with that material on that machine, and then similar materials across multiple machines, we've built up kind of a wealth of knowledge that we're trying to reduce that cycle, to that development cycle time up front. So on the, on the other hand, what would you say are the primary benefits that you see with the increasing adoption of additive manufacturing compared to what we've seen in the past with traditional manufacturing? 
Yeah, there's a lot of really good benefits for, for additive. The first and foremost, which I think might be the most obvious, is, is complexity, part complexity. So you can print, like I said, not necessarily anything, but you can print a lot of different things with additive. There's a lot of design space that's been op opened up with you know, laser powder bed fusion, with binder jet, with electron beam melting. There's just a, a huge design space that's opened up to uh, yeah, be able to find new applications. But in some cases, it is also a, a savings on time and cost. So especially when you start talking about castings and investment castings, there's a lot of cost that goes into, and time that goes into making the tooling required for that process. So with additive, you don't need that tooling. You can just print the part and yeah, get a basically an equivalent part out of it without having to go through that whole cost and time cycle. So not only speaking to, you know, reducing cycle time and developing some of these complex manufacturing processes and complexity, but also how does additive play a part in simplifying supply chains for projects that are immensely complex where you're pulling in parts from many different suppliers in many different corners of the industry. Yeah, so another great thing that you can do with additive is you can start combining parts together. So a lot of these little parts with high complexity that you might need to source independently or build separately and then join together, you can now print them all as one part. So that reduces, like you said, supply chain um, or reduces the time to create POs and source these parts so yeah, there's a lot of benefit to taking a lot of parts in, a, in an assembly and combining them into one now that you have that design freedom to print that complex geometry. So, I mean, we're, we're recording this in the, the summer of 2020, but, uh, <laughs> you know, there are, the world has seen a lot of change in this past year. So I'm curious, what is your thought on the state of the additive manufacturing industry in 2020? And maybe some thoughts on where the industry was going and then kind of where it might be going now and be how that changes. And where do you really see this industry picking its earliest adopters and why, why would we see that being the case? Yeah, so 2020 has been quite the year <laughs> um, for everyone. So our customers are also being impacted. But there's still a lot of potential for, for additive. It, it actually helps with that supply chain simplification and, and actually being able to print parts locally rather than having to source them internationally. That's kind of been a kind of a key component, especially in recent months. As far as you know, early adopters, we, we see a lot of activity in the medical industry, in implants and surgical tools, and a lot also in the space and aerospace industries as well. Our, the space customers are really, really taking additive and running with it. So we're excited to, to be along for the journey for that. And then automotive is also a developing industry especially as the binder jet technology starts to mature. Binder jet will allow for a lot more for lower cost, faster parts, and more high volume parts as well. So that's really what our what those customers are going to be after. A lot of activity across kind of all the industries, all the major industries at this point, but I think each industry is taking the modalities and kind of applying the technology in different ways that work for them. So now that we have an idea for what the state of this industry looks like now, how do you see the space of that additive manufacturing evolving in the next five to 10 years, both in terms of a technological side, in terms of capacity for additive manufacturing to do the amazing things that it promises to be able to do, but also in terms of the application side and where might be the next big exciting application in the space of additive? Yeah, I see a lot of activity around getting more a more stable production process. So I think in the next five to ten years, we're gonna see we're gonna start to see more production applications. At least that's what I hope. Now that a lot of manufacturers are producing machines that are more stable than they have been in the past, and there's also been a lot around automation in terms of an additive factory. So how can you set up multiple machines and automate uh, powder removal? How do you automate moving 
your build from one process step to the next. So I think we're going to start to see more activity around that. And then on the application side, like I said, I hope that more, more people will start implementing this for production, but really as the industries learn and as they grow in their additive capacity, I really just hope to see next level applications, whether they're bigger, so larger parts on larger machines, more advanced alloys. Some alloys were still really hard to print with. So I hope to see that these more advanced alloys will find their niche and especially within a modality that works best for those alloys. So I really like to think about the future and ex specifically about additive manufacturing and how that can make an impact in so many different areas. And so I wanted to kind of give you a tough question here, but how do you imagine specifically in the aerospace field additive playing a role 10 years from now? That, that is a tough question. Um, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, um, honestly, we're still in, in pretty early adoption phases across the board. So I think, you know, from an aerospace perspective, as, as regulatory bodies get more comfortable with additive and learn more about it themselves, the industry is starting to put a lot more rigor and a lot more standardization out there. So these big specification bodies like ASTM and, and SAE, and so they're starting to actually understand more about additive and are starting to, to put out some more standards. So I think as that evolves, regulatory bodies will kind of get a little bit more comfortable with it. So yeah, I think really just adoption of more parts, again, going bigger and start printing structures for like engine structure components. So yeah, I think that's kind of where it's going in, in my humble opinion. That's really cool. I can't wait to see where it goes. We've all noticed an increasing need for materials engineers in this, in this field. I mean, there's exhibits A, B, and C right here. So I was wondering, you know, what role does material science actually play in the additive manufacturing field and how do materials engineers make an impact while this field continues to grow every single year? Well, I may be a little biased, but uh, we believe that materials are what are the glue that holds this whole process together. Yes. <laughs> uh, <I agree>. So. <laughs> are definitely needed and are a really great asset to have uh, for any additive customers, any OEM making machines. Um, everyone needs materials engineers, in my opinion. Again, not biased at all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I said earlier, additive in general is just a great marriage between material science and, and mechanical engineering. So mm -hmm. there's just so much materials science that goes into making the material, right? You're starting from powder in a lot of cases, and you're making a part that's now solidly fused together. So there's a lot of changes that happen in the material going from powder to, to solid part. And that's where we come in. That's where we characterize what the process can do in terms of material capability. We develop how that material is actually being formed. A lot of our team will actually decide what the parameter sets are and go through that whole development cycle. It really helps to have material science knowledge in order to be able to do that. Going even beyond that with post-processing steps, how do you heat treat the part? How do you, do you need to do any surface treatments? How is that going to affect your fatigue life? Materials engineers are really needed at every step of the way, from early process all the way through production and part application. It's really cool to be involved at each of those steps to kind of see how the process evolves and how it turns out. That's good to hear. Yeah, and I mean, we certainly don't mind the bias. I mean, you're, you're <laughs> preaching to the choir a little bit here, so it's, it's all good. This is a material science podcast overall, so it's all, it's all fair game. <laughs> So in terms of additive manufacturing, it's not just this monolithic thing that happens in one singular way, one size fits all method for doing additive manufacturing. So amongst these different modalities of additive manufacturing, which one of these modes do you see being the most promising for wide scale manufacturing in the future? So right now, I think there's been a lot of development and a lot of research around the laser powder bed fusion. So 
both in terms of small to medium sized platforms all the way up to large platform. There's just been a lot of development in recent years around that. So I think as we continue to scale and again, add more stability for these machines, such that you can have multiple machines running and you're very confident that each of those machines is producing the same material. I think we're going to continue to to see that scale up. But I really think that there's a lot of potential for BinderJet as it matures as a an additive modality. So it's going to be very beneficial for high volume applications, and that's what I think of as the future is BinderJet at the moment. Can you go a little bit more into that? What exactly is BinderJet technology and how does that compare with the other processing types like EBM and DMLM? Electron beam has a much higher density of power. So you typically build with larger powder particles and thicker layers. So typically it's a, it's a little bit of a faster process than the laser methods, but the surface quality is usually a little bit less and your feature resolution is also a little bit less. And because it's an electron beam, you actually center the entire powder bed together. So that, that entire powder bed is partially centered into this cake-like structure so that once the electron beam actually hits the powder, you don't want that powder to actually to scatter all over the place. So we mm-hmm. center it together before you actually melt it. But that means if you have any internal structures, it's really hard to get that centered powder out of those internal structures as well. So on the laser side, when the powder is free flowing, it's a lot easier to extract that powder. So between electron beam and laser powder bed fusion, there's a lot of things to consider for your application specifically. And then going to binder jet, binder jet is also a powder bed method. You lay down a layer of powder, but instead of actually melting the powder during the process, you then draw the pattern with a binder, a polymer binder, or it's essentially a glue. Mm -hmm. So you're laying down this layer of glue, you cure it a little bit, and then you lay down the next layer. So you're binding this part together basically with a polymer glue. So then from there, you you need to cure that glue solidly after the part's finished printing. Then you have to depowder that, which is its own challenge because you have this very (laughs) fragile structure that's basically just held together with glue that you then need to clean powder out of. So that proves challenge within itself. But then it goes through a heat treat step where you burn off the polymer glue and then it'll go through a sintering step where you then kind of squish the part all back together and then remove all the porosity that was left by burning the glue off. So a little bit of different post-processing steps on the back end um, as opposed to electron beam and and laser but mainly because you're left with a semi-solid part so you need to get that part solidified whereas laser and electron beam has already melted to that powder together. So is that the biggest like challenge right now is figuring out that fragility and keeping everything together? It is one of the biggest challenges right now, yes. Okay. (laughs) Also, you know, characterizing the fully centered material on the back end as well. But yeah, handling those parts in what we call the green state. So Mm -hmm. before that glue is burned out, yeah, that green state handling is, is a pretty significant challenge right now. Yeah, I just remember talking about the green state in our ceramics class, so it's all coming together now. (laughs) When I was talking with Jack, the other GE additive employee I've gotten to know over the past few weeks, he mentioned that additive is more of like a complement to traditional manufacturing. They kind of always will work hand in hand. I was wondering, do you think additive can ever fully replace traditional manufacturing or do you agree it's something that they'll just go together? Yeah, I think I agree with Jack. It's going to be an additional tool in our tool belt. So I think that there will definitely still be applications where you'll want to go the traditional manufacturing route. And that could be for cost. It could be for lead time. So conversely to what I said earlier, if you have a part that's really easy to machine out of a forging and you're only machining a few features here and there, that might be a little bit cheaper than printing a very large structure. <laughs> I think there will still always be the need for traditional manufacturing 
processes. And even with additive, there are a lot of cases where we'll also post machine additive parts. So I think there's still always going to be a role for machining processes in general, just because some of these applications require very, very, very tight tolerances that just based on physics is going to be near impossible to get to with additive. I think we can improve, but I, I just don't think that there's ever going to be a time where we can print a surface finish of, you know, 32 micro inches RA. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, I think there's gonna always gonna be a role for both. So how do you envision some of these more computer science heavy concepts like machine learning and AI being incorporated into 3D printing technology in the future? And if so, how do you envision that's gonna look? There is definitely a lot going on around machine learning, in situ monitoring, a lot of development being done so far. And there's still a lot of development left to do, to be honest with you. But I think there's a lot of potential for reducing cycle time, both on the production side and on the development side. So as we get smarter about how, especially with a laser or electron beam application, as we get smarter about how weld pools are formed and melt pool theory and how we can then bake that into machine learning and tools like that, the development time should go down. Anytime you introduce a new alloy or want to make a new parameter, you already understand how the melt pool should form. And so that will then help you, you know, just be that much further along in your development cycle. In terms of using it in production, there's still a lot to be figured out around making the process repeatable and reliable. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you detect a defect? So will you actually change your process? And are the regulatory bodies going to be, especially in the aerospace industry, are they going to be okay with a potentially different process in every build? So I think there's still a lot to be considered and a lot to figure out, but maybe in some other industries where you don't have quite the rigor of, you know, heavy regulatory bodies, there could be applications where, yeah, you detect a defect and on the next layer, you might change your melt pool in that one specific area and hopefully be able to, to heal it. But then how do you inspect for it? How do you make sure that the, that defect was actually healed? So I think there's been a lot of exciting development. I think there's a lot of potential for it, but I think there are still a lot of big questions that are going to have to be answered in terms of repeatability and stability. So do you think it is possible to use this in-situ monitoring to catch defects like right on time? Because you were just saying that it's going to be difficult to be able to actually see if you did catch it and if you made the right changes to either cut off the process or adjust as necessary. Yes, there will be a couple of different ways to detect a defect during the printing process. So one way you can do it is to detect a disturbance in the powder bed. So as you lay down the next layer of powder and you see a spot that didn't fully get covered with powder, there might be some sort of, of divot or hole there or just some powder that didn't stick. So that's one way you can actually detect it. Another way is looking at the parts that have already been welded. And if you see an, a discontinuity in how that particular section of part welded compared to the section of part next to it, sometimes you can see those anomalies with the naked eye even. In terms of detection, I think that you know there are several methods out there. But then to your point, how do you then adjust the process for it? And I think that's where there's a lot of room for development. How would you then heal that defect? And then there would definitely have to be a lot of validation on the back end as well during that, that development to make sure that defect closed up, whether you take the part and scan a CT scan it or x-ray it or, or do some sort of non-destructive or destructive testing to figure out whether that defect was healed or not. Can you currently put cameras within the machine? Doesn't it reach super high temperatures? Is that being used right now? Yeah, so GE Additive even has options out there for these cameras to monitor the process. The increase in heat is pretty localized. The chamber itself won't get super, super hot, really just at that weld pool that you'll see those really, really hot temperatures. Gotcha. Bottom line it for me a little bit. So if you were to be talking to someone who's looking to get into the business of additive manufacturing in some perspective or another, 
perhaps Puneet in this example, <laughs> but either as a potential job or career opportunity or as a customer. But what is the main point or points of information you'd really want to emphasize to them and really want to drive home to them? So I think I'll address that to different audiences. I think a general broad statement that could probably actually be applied to anyone is that the additive industry is, is still growing very rapidly. And I think there are just so many cool opportunities out there that we haven't even thought of yet. So it's a really, really exciting space to be in, both from a career opportunity and a, hey, I'm a company that I want to get into additive. How can I make that happen? It's just a really exciting industry to be in right now. So addressing students and those who are looking to start a career in additive, do your research, look around at what's going on in the industry, what's going on on campus, and start to get involved and put your hands on the machines as, as much as you possibly can. That's one opportunity that I wish I had in school, but additive wasn't quite as popular. And then to those out there who are looking to see if additive makes sense for their business, first of all, reach out to us. We at GE Additive are love to talk to people about potential applications and how additive can work best for you and what you can actually achieve with uh, less design restrictions and how creative you can actually be utilizing this technology. So I'm excited to see where the industry takes us. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay, for, for joining us on this episode and for taking part of this. This was a, a great conversation and I certainly learned a lot and I hope everyone too. listening did too. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you for joining us in this week's episode of the It's a Materials World podcast. In the next episode, we'll be back to talk about titanium and its alloys. But until then, if you want to hear from us, we are on LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. All of our social media handles will be in the show notes, but you can also look us up as the It's a Materials World podcast. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. We're just getting started as a show, and we want to grow this show with our community's input. But until then, take care and stay healthy.